name is Stephanie. I'm with the Scientist in Every Florida School program. And today we're stepping into the garden for our virtual field trip series presented by Mounts Botanical Garden and Scientist in Every Florida School. Today's topic is bamboo, the all-purpose plant. First, we're gonna tell you just quickly a little bit about the Scientist in Every Florida School program, which is a free program housed within the University of Florida's Thompson Earth Systems Institute. The CEFS program connects and builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. My colleagues, Brian and Elise and I are super excited to be with you here today. Mount's Botanical Garden is a nationally acclaimed attraction to Florida residents and visitors alike with a mission to inspire and educate through nature. I'd like to introduce to you today, Rochelle from Mounts, who's going to take the reins from here to explore a little bit around the garden and then introduce you to our special guest today. Rochelle? Perfect, thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone, great to see all of you. Um, if I can get to the next slide, please. Just wanna introduce you to Mounts Botanical Garden. If you have not been here, we are a 14 acre garden in West Palm Beach. We've got over 2000 plant species and 25 display gardens from our butterfly garden to a cactus and succulent garden. And we have about 11 clumps of bamboo, which you'll be hearing about from Robert Saparito. If I can have the next slide, please. And so I'd like to showcase some of the 11 bamboo uh, clumps scattered throughout the garden. All of our bamboo are tropical, so they're perfect for our climate. Um, you'll see in the middle there, one of our favorites, the golden bamboo, Bambooza vulgaris vitata. I just love saying that. It sounds like it's coming from a Disney movie. But um, this cluster is memorable. They're outstanding. They look like bright yellow canes uh, with green stripes um, that are almost hand painted. They're quite lovely. And to the right of that is our Timor Black uh, Bamboo Mound. It's another outstanding uh, tropical variety from the forest and island nation of Timor. And the bamboo's uh, canes actually start out green and they slowly turn brown and then black. And I'm just gonna showcase one more cluster for you if I can have the next slide. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And this is our dwarf Buddha belly bamboo. It's one of the more popular varieties with our visitors and especially um, with our local school children. It is one of the most unique bamboo uh, bamboos in the world. And dwarf uh, Buddha belly features this stunning foliage that um, doesn't cover the lower half of the columns. And it showcases, if you can see the picture to your right, the trademark swollen uh, bellies or, or the internodes. So it's very easy to grow. We love it here. And again, it's really popular with the children. We see a lot of them rubbing that little node. Um, so at this time, um, I would love to introduce you to our speaker, Robert Saffredo. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to him, to our scientist and a very good friend to Mount's Botanical Garden. He's the owner of Tropical Bamboo Nursery and Gardens, a rare plant collector since the late 1980s. It was his work in aviation with helicopters in remote areas of the world that led to the discovery of these large timber bamboos, um, which he desired to grow in his own South Florida garden. So Robert reached out to the American Bamboo Society's Florida chapter and ultimately became its president. He directs Tropical Bamboo and Nursery Gardens educational and community outreach efforts. He's done such a wonderful job with that. And currently he serves as the president of the Florida Caribbean chapter of the American Bamboo Society. So a really terrific friend. Um, and I turn it over to you, Robert. All right, thank you, happy to be here. Um, well, as Rochelle said, um, I started um, with helicopters, not, not plants. My career was, uh, my formal education was in aviation. And um, that took me to different places of the world, very remote places of the world. And my hobby was always plants. So um, all the plants that I was discovering in my work, I um, fell in love with bamboo. It was, it was a uh, amazing. It was very diverse. There's a lot of different, uh, uh, more than 1500 species in the world and, and half of them are tropical and half of them are, are temperate. So they grow, um, the temperate bamboos grow where it's cooler up north and the tropicals are where we live in South Florida primarily, but also Southern California along the Gulf coast of Texas, um, Hawaii. Um, so it's fairly limited. The tropicals are fairly limited in the, in the United States. Um, the cold weather will damage or kill them. So, um, but we're lucky to, to be able to grow the tropicals and, and that's what I do for a living now. I, 
I grow and, and sell bamboos, but um, in, in Florida, it's mostly for ornamental use. Uh, there is some function too. They, they're used as a privacy screen. Um, so I'll show that as well, all the, a couple of different applications. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show my little uh, PowerPoint here, if I can. How can I switch to that? I'm trying to switch to share. Okay, here we go. Okay, so as we all know, or most of us know, uh, bamboo is associated with pandas. Um, bam uh, pandas eat bamboo, <laughs> uh, but we do too. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well. Um, where I get most of the bamboos is Southeast Asia. Um, there are bamboos in pretty much every continent except Antarctica, um, native to every continent. But in Southeast Asia, we have China, Thailand, Vietnam, and throughout Indonesia, that's where I'm targeting most of the ones that I've imported. The climate is fairly similar and most of the bamboos thrive here in Florida. Um, when I collect, uh, these places are pretty remote and rural. So the bamboos look like this. They're in a jungle, a forest, um, but I usually have help and there's some of the people there um, are very, uh, very helpful in collecting and, and loading and transporting back to uh, the United States. They're sent directly to the USDA in Maryland for me. They have to go through quarantine. We can't just bring them straight into the United States because they are uh, part of the grass family. And then in the United States, we grow a lot of grass crops for food, um, which include you know, corn, wheat, sugar, and the USDA protects all of those, protects our agricultural interests. And that means keeping bugs out um, that would adversely affect all the grass crops, including of course, bamboo. That, so, so we don't want any hitchhikers. We don't want any bacteria. We don't want any bugs. We don't want any fungus. Um, so they have to go through a period of observation in, in the, at the USDA. And so this is what they look like where, you know, when they're uh, kept there for me, um, they're tested over a period of at least a year, but usually about three years. So they're in, they're in jail for a while. Um, but after they're determined to be clean, they're sent to me and then we start propagating and, and growing them and testing them. And, and um, some of them people like, um, so we sell them. <laughs> this is uh, an example of one of our larger bamboos. Um, it's called Dendrocalamus giganteus. Um, so it's in our main display garden, but that one came from Myanmar, from Burma. Um, that's in Southeast Asia. This is some of our gardens uh, where we've taken some other plants and, and mixed it in as they would be in, the, in their natural environment. And well, I'm gonna just show a few examples of some of the garden pictures. This is what Rochelle was talking about, the Timor black bamboo that was from Indonesia. And this is sort of a close up of a bunch of the, the canes. Um, there's lots of um, diversity, lots of colors, lots of patterns, lots of sizes, lots of shapes. Um, then there's of course some sort of mutated ones. This is the Buddha belly, the dwarf Buddha belly. So it has like an accordion, it's sort of compressed and um, adds a lot of character. I actually didn't like this one when I first saw it. I thought it was kind of creepy, but um, I've grown to love it. Uh, and of course, a lot of people love it in their garden because it's, uh, it's you know, very unique. And then there's even a variety that, of this one, the Buddha belly that has stripes. Um, so it's this really kind of, oh, Dr. Seuss looking bamboo. Uh, this is a kind of a really wild one. It was called dragon bamboo. It doesn't maybe look like much to you, but I thought it was kind of creepy and cool. So it's one of my favorites. This is just an example of how large in diameter the canes can get. And these are coming out of the ground. There's these um, little pyramid things. Well, they're called shoots. That's, the, that's how the bamboo starts. It grows from the ground and sends these telescoping shoots up. And as they continue upward, they eventually reach their height limit and start to harden and develop branches. Um, all those shoots will come up from the ground and reach their full height within 60 days. So there you can almost watch them grow. Um, we've actually put time-lapse cameras on them and, and it's pretty impressive to see them shoot up. Um, this is the fastest growing woody plant on earth. It's in the Guinness Book of Records. So 
it's very um, satisfying to grow because of that. We humans are very impatient. So having that instant gratification with a plant is wonderful. Um, this is a, another black variety. There's about seven different black var varieties of bamboo that we have. The, as Rochelle said, the, uh, the cones come up green and then over time, usually about over a period of about six months, they progressively get darker until they're very black. Um, and that's very popular as an ornamental. Um, but in landscaping, we're also using them now for privacy screening, for creating a giant green wall, a hedge. Um, they can be trimmed like this or just sort of let, let grow naturally. And this, you can see it takes up a very small space on the ground and, and it helps create a natural separation between neighbors. Uh, more pictures of the garden. There's some red um, shoots there and another uh, giant bamboo with somebody standing amongst it. And now we'll go back to the shoots that we talked about earlier. The um, bamboo shoots are, um, they're actually mostly are edible by humans. So many of us have e e eaten them in restaurants without even knowing it, especially Asian, you know, Chinese restaurants, they're mixed in with the stir fries. Um, but these little shoots, as they come up, um, right about the size they are in this photograph, they're cut off, they're very soft. You can snap them off like an asparagus. Um, and they're usually chopped up and uh, they have to be normally, most of them have to be boiled first. They're, they're a little bit bitter. So you boil them for about 20 minutes and then cook with whatever sauces or, or whatever recipes you have for bamboo shoots. And um, they're really delicious. This is a nice little insect. They call them an elephant beetle in, in China. This is the one of the ones that we don't want to have as a hitchhiker coming into the United States. Um, but in China, those are also eaten. The, the insect is eaten. Um, barbecued. I haven't eaten one, but um, uh, they look uh, delicious, don't they? <laughs> uh, this is a, a cut and clean, sh you know, a couple of shoots, and they are. Um, ready to be you know, used right there. Now we also build with bamboo. We build with it either as a whole material, like in this photograph, we've made a little bridge. Here you can see the, the traditional canes and, and they're joined together. And this is a, this is a more <laughs> extravagant bridge um, than the one we built. And there's a cathedral. This is actually a hotel in, in Bali. So you could go to Bali, Indonesia and stay at that hotel. In our gardens at the nursery, we have several structures, um, but the most current, the most recent structure was built by an artist. He, he built us a spider. Um, and <laughs> so this, this was a, built for a, a museum in Los Angeles, um, but it was taken down and sent to us. And now we have it in our garden. Um, this is called the orb weaver spider. And you can see it's made all out of bamboo. So that's kind of a fun thing to have. And we're putting plants, we're putting bamboo around it and creating its own little little habitat. Um, so um, this is another garden picture. And that is about it for the photographs. Um, did we want to go for a question and answer session here? Is that is that the next? Um, we'll start. Sure. We, we can jump into the Q&A. Um, and then perhaps if you have more to share, if those questions uh, bring up some more ideas, we can certainly go back to you to share more as well. So our first question is coming from Donna, who says, where is your nursery or garden? Okay, the nursery is in Loxahatchee. It's, uh, that's about maybe 10 miles west of I-95, um, just on Okeechobee Boulevard, uh, near Royal Palm Beach, just north of Wellington. So it's, it's and our website is tropicalbamboo.com. And there's plenty of uh, information as far as directions and, and the address and everything there. Great. And if any of our viewers have additional questions for Robert, please write them in the chat and I'll certainly ask them on your behalf. Uh, one of the questions, I guess, just to jump start and that I have is what gives bamboo so much strength? Well, the fiber, it's full, it's full of silica. Bamboo is full of silica. It's very hard. Silica is from sand. Um, and it also makes it very tough on tools when we're cutting bamboo. Um, it cuts like any wood, but it, but it really really dulls the saws and the tools quickly. And that's because of the silica that's in it. But also there's long, long fibers that run longitudinally the, the length of the, the cane. And that makes it uh, very strong in that, in that regard. So. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Annie, who asks, how do you propagate bamboo? Well, that's a great question. Um, so bamboo is, um, like in any plant, can be grown from seed. Um, but unfortunately, bamboo only flowers about one, every 100 years on average. So seeds are rare, and especially a seed from a specific variety or species. Um, also, there's a lot of um, variety in the bamboo plants that are grown from seeds. So it's not necessarily something you want. So we, we as a nursery, we want to clone them. We want to produce an exact copy of the parent plant. And so we take, um, we, we want to take, depending on the species, take nodal cuttings and we use some of the hormones. We soak them in some of the hormones and we put them into a controlled environment, which is, we call it a greenhouse. It's really a, just a, a propagation house. It's a very hot and humid environment um, where irrigation comes on every 10 minutes and keeps them from desiccating, the cuttings from desiccating, um, which means we don't want them to dry out um, before they can root. Um, roots are formed at the, the base of the primary branch that comes out of each node. Each, each cane has, has segments and, and the segments are separated by nodes and that's where the branches come out of and that's where we want to propagate. But that's, they're all different. All the bamboos are very different and they don't, a lot of them don't respond to that. So we have to, um, if that doesn't work, we have to take them out of the ground or out of their containers and literally divide them, split them up. Um, and that's sometimes sacrificial. I mean, you're, you, you'd lose some because they shock, but it's an option. It's very, it's very labor intensive, but it's a way to do it. Um, and the other way is to do it in test tubes. And, and we have a small lab on our property and, and it's just a micro propagation process where we take some of the plant tissue and we put it into a very clean, very sterile environment in a jar or a test tube and, and then um, force them using what's called cytokinins. It's a hormone that causes uh, the plant to multiply rapidly. Um, and then once we get the, the plant to multiply, meaning making lots of branches, we separate those and make more branches, separate those, make more branches. Then we get to a point where we have the number we need. We add a, a rooting hormone, which is uh, an auxin. Um, and that hopefully creates roots. And then we have a bunch of tiny little, um, what look like seedlings, but they are actually clones of the parent plant. Um, the hardest thing to do with that is to keep them clean. And I mean, microscopically clean. Um, they are very, um, I would say dirty um, internally. There's a lot of places in bamboo for bacteria or, or fungal spores to hide. So we have to get them completely clean. That's the biggest challenge and keep them clean. Um, so, but if you need to make a large number of plants, any kind of plant, that's the way to do it. Um, so we have about seven species out of our 100 and well, we actually have more than that. We have about 270 species now, but seven of those we're, we've initiated in our little lab because the volume is, you know, justifies that the volume needed is, you know, justified by that. Sure. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Frankie and Riley who are curious, what kind of bugs live on bamboo? Well, thankfully, not a lot um, in, in Florida. You know, we've kept the ones that are, you know, would come with them out by using the quarantine system. Um, but there are some mealy bugs. There are some scale insects. Uh, there's some spider mites, none of which will harm the bamboo. It, they just create aesthetic damage. Um, you'd see some little spots or, or some marks. Most people wouldn't actually see that. And there are luckily natural controls for those as well in, in Florida or throughout the United States, like uh, ladybugs and things like that. Um, but, you know, some people want to spray because they want it to be completely, you know, pristine and perfect looking. So there are insecticides that are used sometimes if that's the choice made. Gotcha. Uh, Hazel's wondering, are all bamboo invasive? No, that's a good question too. So, so out of the 1500 plus bamboo species, about half of them are tropical, as we said, and half of them are temperate, which grow up north. Most of the ones that grow up north are temperate, and that means that they are running bamboos. And amongst the running bamboos, they, uh, there are a few of them that are hyper running. They're very, very aggressive. Um, and those are the ones that come with a bad reputation for being invasive. Um, they can be contained. You know, There's barriers you can put in the ground, or you can even just use water features to contain them or just grow them in the container, a pot. Um, the tropical bamboos, they grow in a clumping form. And I'm gonna to try to describe this um, clearly. They're, they're, the root system, the rhizome system is, is completely different. 
The clumping bamboos have what they call a pachymorphic rhizome system. A pachymorph means, well, it's related to an elephant, like an elephant's trunk. So the, the little shoots, they sort of curl and come up. And if you see a, uh, underground, if you see what it looked like underground, it would look like a bunch of elephant's trunks curving upward. And they stay in a very tight um, footprint. Uh, they're, and, they, and then they grow to a very finite circumference or diameter. Um, Tropical bamboos, they've evolved to grow in a mixed forest, a jungle, and they, they need to go vertical. They need to get to the canopy and through the canopy before anything else to survive. They need to get to the sun. The temperate bamboos that are, and especially the ones that are known to be invasive, are, are really a monoculture plant. They want to just take over and they grow horizontally. They, they don't really normally grow in a mixed environment. They grow all by themselves and, and you would be in them amongst, a, you know, in their natural environment in a bamboo forest. They're pretty much be nothing else growing there. And it's really impressive. And I wish I actually could grow some of them, but those running invasive temperate bamboos don't seem to do very well in Florida. It's too hot and they need to have a resting period in the winter time. And um, so we have a few that we are able to grow in the shade and we keep them contained and, and they're, they're wonderful and they're beautiful. Um, but back to the original question, they're not all invasive. <laughs> they all are very diverse, you know, they're very diverse and they have, um, no, they, they, the tropicals will generally not be invasive and the temperates, many of them will be. That's pretty All much right, it. thank you so much. We're gonna transition over to the idea of maintenance right now. Mm -hmm. So Lisa writes in and says, can you talk to us a little bit more about the Buddha belly bamboo? She said, I get a lot of offshoots that diminish the look of the swollen stems. At what point should they be cut off? Um, hmm. Well, it's the, well, the, first of all, there's several um, species that are commonly called Buddha's belly, but it, assuming it's the one that's most common down here, which is Bambusa vulgaris huaman, um, that one will belly very aggressively, and I mean, not in a bad way, very <laughs> aggressively in a good way um, when it's happy. So it gets plenty of water, plenty of drainage, plenty of sun, plenty of fertilizer and, and mulch and things like that. Um, and the shoots that come up, I, I would say if there are any that are not belly, that are kind of you know, not adding to the aesthetics of the, of the overall plant, you would cut them at the ground, remove them. Um, but you, I would use the rule of thirds. I mean, you don't want to ever remove more than one third of the total mass of any plant. So, so you kind of, that's my rule of thirds anyway. Uh, it's not photography. Anyway, um, the, uh, so you don't want to take out too much. You don't want to set it back. Um, but yeah, it is a grass. It doesn't mind being mowed. And it was a grass, so you can mow it pretty often just, just trying to, you know, keep it to about a third of the total number of canes, count them, remove, you know, one third of those and, and, you know, have some logic, you know, with uh, the balance or the symmetry of the plant um, when you remove them. Um, you can cut the ends of the, the branches too and shape it a little bit, um, not a problem. Just when you're cutting branches or if you're cutting a cane, that's, you're not cutting it to the ground, just try to cut it down to a node just above a node. Um, so you don't have sort of this little dead stick, you know, at the very end, which would be kind of ugly. Um, wouldn't hurt the plant. The plant really doesn't care what it looks like, but um, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's the idea. Just cut down to a node and um, oh gosh. Yeah. Just, uh, it also depends on the age of the bamboo. If it's been in for about a year or two, you're pretty much good to go. It's, it's going to be rooted in well and, and you can go start going to town on it. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So we're actually getting quite a bit of questions about maintenance and individual situations. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask, where can people go to learn more about what an appropriate bamboo would be for their neighborhood or their climate or more, their area? Who can they reach out to or what websites can they go to to learn more about what bamboo would be appropriate for their home and how to maintain that? Sure. Um, okay, so you could email us or call us at the nursery info at tropicalbamboo.com or the numbers on the website, tropicalbamboo.com. And there's also a search tool on our website. Um, it'll be up at the top navigation part where it says search bamboo or find my bamboo. There's a couple of links on the website for that. And that allows you to um, just check some little radio buttons and, and um, select your zone or your put, even put in your zip code. And that will at least filter through our long list of bamboos and reveal the, the, the bamboos that are appropriate for your zone or your climate. And you can, yeah, like I said, you could also, you know, put in um, dimensions, you know, what size you want to grow and then it'll, it'll further filter down this, the selections. Otherwise, um, 
the American Bamboo Society, the Florida chapter of the American Bamboo Society is um, another option. I would just just Google that American Bamboo Society and and uh, your local chapter, which in Florida is the Florida Caribbean chapter. Um, very helpful. There's meetings. These are all being held up in Orlando now. So um, the actual in-person meetings, workshops, things like that. Um, so if you want to yeah, if you can travel to Orlando, that's something, but otherwise you can be involved and get newsletters, things like that, just by joining the American Bamboo Society's Florida chapter. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. For our next question is gonna come from Melissa. She writes, bamboo makes a beautiful sound when breeze passes through them. Do you have a favorite bamboo sound or a favorite type of bamboo that makes that sound? Uh, yeah, so there's, there, are a, <laughs> there are great sounds. There, there's this sort of ocean sound, which she was, talking about where the air is going through the leaves, but there's also the creaking and clicking and the violin-like sounds when they're rubbing together. Um, those are generally with the timber bamboos. And, and we have a bamboo that's called the dragon's nest bamboo, bambusa dissimilator. It's really not attractive. It's not a pretty bamboo. From a distance, it looks really nice, but it's, it's just a big, well, dragon's nest. But because of all that density, there's a lot of movement, you know, within the clump and it's just a big orchestra of sounds when the when the wind's blowing um but otherwise i mean most of the timber bamboos those are that's where you're going to get the the greatest sounds um beyond the the wind moving through the leaves um any of the bamboos will, will give you that sound um but if you want some of those clicks and groans and and rattling sounds um you'd have to get a larger size bamboo so that it would take up quite a bit of space but it's worth it um, as we start to wrap up, just the time for maybe one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. For this last question or so, um, we have a question about the timeline itself. What is the timeline in terms of when you go to another country, um, find the bamboo essentially that you want to work with mm -hmm. um, to the point where it's imported and you could start the production process? Um, well, the, the year of collection starts and then and then the bamboos are sent um usually dhl that takes a couple of days to get to the usda in beltsville um at that point uh, the quickest we've ever received plants out of quarantine was about 18 months um, but the longest was more than three years um so it's a long process and and understand that they're only allowing germplasm it's not a commercial method of importation you can only bring in about two copies of any one species um, and they're maintained and, and they're sent to us if they survive it's a it's an arduous process so sometimes they die um, but we're we're, we're have about 80 percent survival now and, and sometimes they die because they're destroyed i mean they have a, a pathogen that's not allowed and, and they can't get rid of it so it's the bamboo's burned um, but about 80% um, survival is really good. And we've gotten it to that point. It used to be about 50%. Um, so we've improved our methods of collection and pre preservation. We send them with some, you know, hydrogel, things like that. But they're sent with no soil, no leaves. You have to, you know, scrub them. We take them to sometimes, you know, we'll try to find a, a, a car wash even to try to wash all the soil off of them if we can find something like that. Otherwise, we take them to a hotel room or take them to a river and wash them in a river. But um, so that, that, you know, we get them to the USDA and, and after about maybe one to three years, um, the one or two copies is sent directly to us. Um, we have that precious little specimen and um, we'll put it right in the ground to see it because we've got to further test it to see if it's going to like where it lives now, you know, and, and see how it, how it goes. And after about maybe six months, we could tell if it's going to thrive. I mean, it's, sometimes it's just trying to keep it able to survive you know if we keep it uh, you know then it's just a reference plan if it's not going to thrive now it's not something that we're going to propagate and sell um but uh if we've got it you know and it looks like it's going to be a winner um in uh in this climate in florida then beyond then uh, we'll propagate it and and hopefully start building up numbers usually after let's say so we're about three years in just when we have the plants then it's going to take another year to get a plant that we can propagate from and then it takes another two or three years to get enough numbers to uh to start releasing them so it's it's at least five years six years from the time we've collected to the time it actually becomes available but you know i always have them in a, it's sort of like a conveyor belt i collect every year 
so we're getting plants out of quarantine pretty much every year. Um, so it's not as painful a wait that way. Sure. Let's wrap up with one more. Okay. Ruth writes in and says, are you still looking for new bamboo varieties? And I'm, I guess I'm also curious, are scientists also finding new bamboo varieties and species still to this day? Yes and yes. The, there are taxonomists all over the world. They're brilliant. Um, they're, they're working in the field. And that's honestly, that's, that's kind of how I get my leads. You know, they're almost out there scouting for me. Um, I don't just go blind looking, you know, wandering around trying to find something that's already found. By the time I arrive, I'm just kind of, I just show up and, and do damage. You know, I just start, start digging. Or, um, but there's always, always somebody there in the field, somebody, you know, and, and um, in all over. I mean, there's, there's a usually young, you know, very enthusiastic taxonomists that are, I mean, they have much more passion than I do. It's, it's amazing to see. Um, and uh, it's their life. I mean, they've, they published, you know, papers and they're, they're kind of famous in their little world. Um, so they, but they'll, they'll tip me off. They'll, wow, well, we found a few new ones and they're, they're finding them all the time and identifying and, and um, but Finding the ones that I want, um, the ones that that would be, you know, people that would would want to buy in in you know for landscaping for ornamental use. That's that's different. I mean, to me, to be honest, a lot of the bamboos that are being discovered and uh, identified, and and I mean, I look at them and they all look the same to me, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, every once in a while, and especially if there's a flowering event, a very rare, rare flowering event, and and it's happened naturally, and there's there's seedlings years later um, that are growing and, and there's some mutations, you know, and some, some little, a um, lot of variegation or striation in the, in the new, the new varieties, then that's something that I'm interested in. Um, some the uniqueness, you know, anything that's would stand out. Um, so every trip I make, I, I get about six or seven plants used to be 20, 30 different species, but now I'm being more selective. Um, um, so that's about the number every year, about maybe six, seven. If I make two trips, then double that. But um, last year I didn't travel at all, of course, for COVID. Um, but I had some friends that were living and working in some countries that were able to send. I think we've got only three the varieties were sent to the USDA last year. Um, but that was just almost me being defiant. You know, I'm not going to lose a year because of COVID, and we're going to get some bamboos in. And so. It happened, and this year um, we'll see. COVID's looking better. I mean, we're um, we're optimistic about the second half of this year, so maybe we can make a trip. And if I do, it would be to to uh, Taiwan. Um, there's some babies there that are waiting for me, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, All right. Well, this was really an incredible learning experience. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. At this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Stephanie to start to wrap things up. Thanks, Brian. And thank you so much, Robert, for such an insightful and delightful presentation on all of these wonderful bamboo varieties. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, we would love for everybody to take a quick moment to fill out the survey. Um, the link I will post again, there we go. It's in your chat box now. You can click on that link, it's a live one. And tell us a little bit about your experience today with us. That'd be great and much appreciated. And finally, we would like for you to know how you can learn more about Mount's Botanical Garden and the Scientist in Every Florida School program by visiting our website you see here on your screen. You can follow us on social media and you can also find a recording of this particular event at our YouTube channel at Earth Systems, um, UF Earth Systems. We will also be looking forward to seeing you at our next virtual field trip. That particular collaborative with Mount's will be on April 13th at 10 a.m. and the topic will be planet protectors, recycling mavens, mushrooms. So we hope to see you then. Until then, have a great day 